Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Where is the largest private collection of United States military vehicles anywhere? In Dubois. And Dan Starks plans to have them all available on display beginning Memorial Day 2019. Next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. We're with Dan Starks. Dan, thank you so much for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. First of all, why Du Bois, Wyoming, for what it is that you plan? Well, we have several answers to that. The, the main reason that we're putting this museum here in Du Bois is because this is a collection that belongs to my wife and me and we live here and so we uh, want this collection to be where we can enjoy it uh, continue to enjoy it as well as make it available for any member of the public who would be interested in uh, military history u.s military history u.s military vehicles the conditions that our military have fought in uh, over numerous wars uh, anyone who's interested in those kinds of things we want to uh, do our part to provide uh, both education uh, for uh, people interested in those kinds of things. And also we wanna preserve history. And so why not Du Bois? I, I think uh, the only other thing I would say there is I think of the example of the uh, Baseball Hall, Hall of Fame. Why is that in Cooperstown? And who ever heard of Cooperstown but for the, uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame? There's no reason that this military vehicle museum in Du Bois cannot be similarly, similarly associated. And the name that you have planned for this museum is? The Wyoming Museum of Military Vehicles. And you hope to open to the public in? We plan our grand opening for Memorial Day 2019. Dan, our cameras right now can maybe see a dozen or so of the military vehicles that you have here. Let's talk about the first time that you purchased a tank. Yeah. How did that come about? I was uh, a sponsor for a fundraiser uh, to uh, raise money for what now is the Nevada State Veterans Memorial. Uh, my wife and I created a foundation to, uh, to put such a memorial in place. And as part of our fundraising efforts, we had a, uh, uh, we called it the American Heroes Challenge, where we had a number of veterans and uh, first responders come and de demonstrate their skills. At our American uh, Heroes Challenge, I met a veteran who uh, uh, had one armored uh, vehicle. He told me that he had access to a, a World War II Sherman tank. And I, uh, uh, when I heard that, I'd never heard, I'd never imagined such a thing. And I didn't think a private person could own a Sherman tank. But uh, in my discussions with this veteran, uh, I, uh, I came to acquire uh, the Sherman tank that he had. At the time, it was a 30-ton paperweight, completely rusted out. It had been sitting on a firing range for, uh, for uh, 30 or 40 years, something like that. And, uh, and uh, so I uh, undertook to restore it, uh, thinking it would be a modest project. And uh, that was my first tank. And we don't have, or you don't have here, a few vehicles, or a dozen vehicles, or 30 or 40 vehicles. How many vehicles now are part of your collection? Well, right now we have, my wife and I have 120 U.S. military vehicles, uh, including tanks uh, from, uh, from just the very beginning of World War II and virtually every kind of tank that was used in World War II, light tanks, medium tanks, uh, many different kinds of Sherman tanks. We have uh, tanks from the Korean War, from the Vietnam War. Uh, we have a tank prototype uh, from uh, the uh, uh, 1980s, an Abrams prototype tank. Uh, we have a number of non-tank tracked armored vehicles. We have what people call soft skin military vehicles, jeeps, trucks. Uh, we have artillery pieces uh, and uh, altogether now 120 and, and counting. And counting. Not only that, one of the greatest collections, well, first of all, 
This is one of the largest collections of military vehicles anywhere. Is that correct? Yeah, well, and certainly of U.S. military vehicles. So our theme is to preserve and educate on U.S. military history. And so there are other uh, collections that would have um, German vehicles, British vehicles, French, Italian, Japanese, uh, Russian. Uh, and we've, we've chosen to devote ourselves exclusively to U.S. military history. And so we have either the largest or one of the largest U.S. military vehicle uh, private collections in, in the United States, certainly, and probably in the world. You want research to happen here. You have an incredible array of original manuals for many of your tanks and vehicles. We have a complete collection of every technical manual and every operating manual for literally every single U.S. military uh, land vehicle used in World War II. Many uh, thousands of uh, documents, the, uh, so uh, it uh, fills up a whole uh, uh, railroad boxcar. And uh, we're, we're in the process of cataloging this collection. When we came across this collection, it was being poorly preserved. It was partly exposed to the elements. We found uh, uh, rodents uh, doing damage to the collection. So we've now uh, obtained that collection. We have it here in our facility. We're in the process of cataloging it, and it will become the basis of the uh, research library that will be part of our military vehicle museum. The military vehicles that we are looking at, I think people will be amazed to know, operate. They work. You can drive this tank. When you restore, it's not just a coat of paint here. The detail is absolutely fascinating. And that is what makes this really live. Uh, th that is, uh, there's so much difference to seeing something that is, I would call, an inert piece of equipment and you say so what and yeah it's interesting to some people and has a little bit of interest to a larger group of people but to really see the completely restored detail to see the equipment to see the the labeling that's inside a tank to see uh, all of the thoughtfulness that the uh, military uh, planners uh, used to think about the fighting circumstances and the living circumstances of our veterans and, and what could they do to help our veterans be successful during their time of service. Seeing all of, all of the detail is what really makes this live and makes it far more meaningful in my mind. We're sitting here in um, what you affectionately called to me at one time, your tank garage, and I responded, not many people in the United States say they have a garage for tanks, but this is not the museum. You have a very different vision of what the museum will be when it's finished. Yes, uh, we, uh, the, the footprint for our museum building is a four acre footprint for the building to give you an idea of the scale. And so we're, we're, and we're imagining uh, right now, uh, it, well, let me just say that it wasn't so long ago, I bet you 12 months ago, uh, we had maybe 70 military vehicles. So it's possible to really expand uh, uh, in, a, in a reasonably short period of time with intense focus, which is what uh, we've given to this. And, and, and we're not anywhere near done with uh, defining our collection. There, there's more to collect that's well worthwhile that uh, it'll take a little bit of time, but uh, we're very much focused on it. So we want this, we don't want to outgrow the museum. We want the museum to have plenty of capacity, not only for what we have to offer today, but for what we will have to offer uh, uh, as we continue to expand our uh, five years from now. And you're contemplating a design such that it would be maybe like someone who was walking over a hill into a United States military camp in World War II. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and no, so, not cement floors. Literally, like you would be right there. Exactly. And, and then even to say a little bit more about that, what would it be like to be right there? We want this to be... Uh, really, it's, it's kind of like a, a living tableau. Uh, and so uh, the setup will imagine a night defensive position for a U.S. military unit in the uh, European theater of World War II. And so this will give us an opportunity to show how all of these different pieces of equipment functioned uh, and how they functioned, uh, what had a specialty defensive function, what had a specialty offensive function, uh, and how, how did these different vehicles support each other. And so we, we are going to lay it all out in a way that helps anyone who's coming to see the history and to, to be educated to really appreciate, ah, so that's why this 
doesn't have a top on the turret. And that's why uh, this has a, a machine gun as well as a cannon, and that's why this one doesn't. The difference in speed, the difference in ability to, uh, to uh, you know, the, all of the capabilities. I mean, there's, it's, it's the fun of it, really, is to, to have all of this uh, uh, shown in a way that it really lives. Before we move on, and we're going to get a chance to kind of um, look around at some of your favorite pieces, I want to just go talk a little bit about your background. You were CEO of a Fortune 500 company, living in a big city, and now you're here. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, um, it's, uh, you know, I, I hope to continue to live life to the fullest. And uh, the, uh, the, the idea that uh, in different chapters of a person's life, a person has the opportunity to taste such different experiences to me is just awesome and uh, uh, beyond anything that I ever could have planned. Uh, so I did enjoy the corporate world and Fortune 500. Uh, we, our business was life-saving medical devices. Uh, uh, our, our claim to fame and part of what made us uh, get out of bed every morning was we helped save a life every three seconds of every hour of every business day. So that was very worthwhile and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm, and now I'm doing something completely different. My wife and I uh, just love uh, the outdoors. We love the Rocky Mountains. We love uh, uh, privacy. We love the peacefulness. And uh, so, so we're here to stay. And, uh, and uh, we've, uh, uh, we now have a working cattle ranch that we've uh, founded, as well as our ongoing initiative to establish and maintain uh, in perpetuity this uh, military history museum. Well, Dan, we've um, taken our cameras to every corner of Wyoming and we've seen a lot of surprises. Nothing matches this. And let's, Thank you. let's go walk around and take a tour, shall we? Yes. So Dan, the first tank you would like to show us is, and it has a great story behind it too. This tank is an M18 Hellcat tank destroyer from World War II. This particular, this actual tank itself has been documented that it fought in the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944. Uh, and uh, so uh, I won't go into the history of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, some people will, will know the name, but this, you know, this was just a huge surprise counterattack by the Germans against the Allied forces. Uh, they knocked our lines back uh, uh, hundreds of miles. Uh, this is where the Battle of Bastogne became famous, where the 101st Airborne uh, held out against the German counter surprise counterattack uh, that uh, completely surrounded Bastogne with the 101st Airborne uh, defending uh, the perimeter of Bastogne. Uh, so, uh, and, and in that battle, we, we have a videotape of the actual commander of this actual tank uh, who fought in the Battle of the Bulge. And that's what makes it so special. Uh, and uh, the, the, the function of the tank destroyer was, uh, the, it, you, you can't see it from here, but all, you, it, you can see the turret and it looks like it's a tank. Technically, it's not a tank. There's no top on that turret. This is an open turret. Uh, and uh, the, this is stripped down so that it's very lightweight compared with a Sherman tank. And, the, and, and because it's lightweight, it's faster. And so the function of this tank destroyer was to be defenseless except for its speed and use its speed to get to the side or the rear of German armor and destroy it with this 76 millimeter gun. Uh, and uh, so if, with a Sherman tank, if you fired at a German tank uh, head on with an armor piercing round, the armor piercing round, just as you saw in that movie Fury, uh, where the Sherman tanks would fire at that Tiger tank and they'd bounce off the front of the armor. That literally is what happened. We did not have the power to penetrate the frontal armor of the, uh, of the best German tanks. You had to get around to the side or get around to the rear where the armor was thinner and uh, penetrate with an armor piercing round that way. And the only way you could have a chance to get around there because they've got a more powerful gun, they have more powerful armor. You try to do it in a Sherman tank the way that you saw in the movie Fury where Brad Pitt and his crew did eventually get around to the rear and uh, take out that tank. But you had to do it by being faster. Mm -hmm. And you could, and, and this is exactly the same engine as a Sherman tank, the same chassis, but de-armored, de no top on the turret so it won't weigh as much, no machine guns so it doesn't weigh as much, just stripped down. It's like the little guy on a football team where he better be fast because he's going to get absolutely crushed unless he's faster than the big uh, football players that are working to tackle him. 
when you learn on what needs to happen to restore a tank like this, how is it your manuals that provide the detail on exactly how to make it just like it was? And then how is that communicated to finding someone who can actually do the restoration work? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a fair amount of, of uh, literature on a number of these vehicles. And, and so the, the archive library that we have with complete technical specifications uh, and, uh, for every part, for every piece of equipment, we generally do not have to resort to. Generally, there are other sources uh, that, are, that are available, but, but when we need to get into detail and can't find the information elsewhere, we know that we have uh, the, the answer in our uh, research library. So, 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 but um, there are people that are in the business of restoring uh, uh, these vehicles, and you can find people that uh, will, they'll, they'll specialize. You can find somebody who only works on World War II ve vehicles, and then maybe they've uh, worked on a number of World War II tanks. Other people just work on smaller vehicles, not on tanks at all, not on armored vehicles. They work on soft skin vehicles. So you've got to just work to get as many different um, you know, vendors, uh, as uh, many different restorers as, as you can establish contact with. We're always looking and we're always interested in, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have far more need than we do capability to continue restoring our entire collection. Uh, but, um, so there's, you know, there's a, there's, there's, there's a different answer every time on how do you, how do you find out, uh, where do you get the expertise, how do you get all the details. It's important to note too, you, although you have a lot of World War II vehicles here, you also have some vehicles from other wars. Oh yes, and uh, we, um, about half of our collection is World War II vehicles. Uh, the remainder of our collection includes uh, Korean War vehicles, we have a number of Vietnam War vehicles, we have some post-Vietnam War vehicles. Uh, the post-Vietnam War part of our collection is the weakest, and that's where we'll expand the most here as time goes by. On the Vietnam War side, we've got some great pieces. Uh, we've got uh, uh, the, the pieces that really uh, resonate with veterans of the Vietnam War as they see uh, pieces of equipment that they lived and fought in. Uh, uh, but we have more to expand to the Vietnam War part of our collection as well. And the Korean War was, was uh, there weren't so many specialty vehicles for the Korean War. There's World War II carryovers, and then there are uh, pieces from uh, right there at 1950, 1951. And we've got some of those. So, but our, our, our focus is not World War II. Our focus is the U.S. American military experience as reflected in the vehicles that the veterans used. It's also important for you to make veterans part of this vision. Well, I'm working closely with several veterans. Uh, the people that I consider to be my, my colleagues are uh, veterans uh, and uh, are uh, very involved and uh, helpful in this. And uh, ne neither my wife nor I served in the military. We both have a very deep appreciation for the benefits that we enjoy as a result of of generations of, of military veterans and military service. And so we're very interested in providing uh, job opportunities uh, for veterans. We have uh, a, a particular uh, veteran managed business uh, in a different state. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, work to reach out to veterans and uh, offer as much uh, return to people as we can. And this whole museum is a return to, uh, is one of the ways that we can offer something back to the veteran community to really celebrate uh, their experience and their sacrifice and their service. Again, this is all in Dubois, Wyoming. And we have more to see. Let's continue our tour. Okay. Dan, this is a tank that served both in World War II and in Korea. Yes. And has quite a story. Yes. This is an M7 Priest. The M7 Priest is a self-propelled artillery piece. So as you think about a cannon and think about a 105 millimeter cannon, for example, that could be transported one of two ways. It could be towed behind some vehicle that pulls it, or it could be self-propelled. This is self-propelled. So it sits, it's got its own tracks. It looks like a tank. Again, technically it's not a tank. It's a self-propelled artillery piece, uh, but it has the same uh, bottom as a Sherman tank. 
and this was part of our mass production uh, uh, strategy in World War II and part of how we were able to be so successful with our supply of military equipment uh, with common parts and using the same platform to do a lot of different things. So this Sherman tank platform included our ability to put a 105 millimeter howitzer on it. You'll, if you climbed up on this, you'd see that there's no top to this uh, uh, priest. Uh, and it has a 50 caliber machine gun uh, there, and th that's the basis for the name. It looks like a pulpit in a church, mm -hmm. so this was called Call the, the priest as a nickname. Oh, okay. uh, and the, the function of this was to go along with our tanks. Uh, the, the Sherman tank would fire generally between about 1,000 and 2,000 yards. Most of the tank battles would take place about at that distance. The, uh, the priest would fire a larger round up to seven miles. Wow. And so this was part of our strategy to uh, deal effectively with uh, the enemy armor. If we could start to assault them uh, before they were within range to shoot us, particularly if they had more powerful guns than our Sherman tanks, uh, this, we'd either get them with our artillery or we'd get them with airplanes. Uh, and a lot of times the aircraft uh, wouldn't have the conditions to be able to participate in the fight with uh, bad weather, but the, uh, the artillery always could. And if you could have that artillery capable of traveling everywhere the tank traveled and then fire in advance, mm -hmm. that was the function of this M7 Priest. Uh, one of the things that I like the most about this particular piece is that uh, it came with a story from a World War II veteran who served in an M7 priest. Uh, I have a picture of this uh, uh, veteran here, uh, and uh, th this veteran was kind enough to, uh, to give us copies of all of his uh, military records. Uh, he, uh, this uh, veteran uh, 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 earned five bronze stars. Uh, uh, this veteran wrote a narrative. Uh, we've, got, we've got pictures of him in theater, uh, and he wrote a narrative of, uh, of his experience beginning in 1942. He was drafted in the Army in 1942, and so he's written for us his, his career story, his military career story. We have it all right here. So as you look at it again, and you look at this and say, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. Well, it's a lot more than just interesting sure. when you see uh, the, the, this person uh, this lost. It's American veteran. It's this American is veteran's happened. history and what happened. He lost, he lost friends. Uh, he uh, sacrificed tremendously, and here he's uh, lived to a ripe old age. He's uh, in his 90s now, and, and uh, he's uh, happy to share a story with us. Before we move on, one of the things that you've noted is that these tanks and these um, artillery units, they weren't designed for comfort, and that's something that can really be noticed here. When you get inside, I, uh, the first time I climbed inside a Sherman tank, I immediately got claustrophobic. And uh, I mean, there, there were five soldiers in gear inside a Sherman tank. Uh, and uh, when you get inside and, and then you put the hatch down, uh, you, you, can't, you, you can hardly move around. I mean, even if I'm in, I'm in a tank by myself in street clothes, working, m maneuvering inside, and it's difficult. Uh, and uh, I just imagine having four more people in there with me in combat gear with the ability to look outside only through a little slit periscope, a viewing uh, a lens, just a little slit. And every time you fire the gun, you go deaf. Every time you fire the gun, the interior fills up with smoke. Mm. You can't open the hatch to clear the smoke. I mean, just you, you get inside one of these and start to think about what the real world was like for a soldier fighting in these conditions. These, and it's absolutely heroic. These soldiers that you have talked to me about, they weren't in there for an hour necessarily, or 10 hours, or 15 hours, or... They could be in, they could be inside that enclosed area with the hatch down for 72 hours. I've read uh, uh, the history of, of a, a tank crew, for example, that was inside with the hatches closed for 72 hours in winter fighting conditions. Uh, everything that they had to do for that 72 hours had to happen without the hatch opening. Uh, uh, you can just imagine all of the challenges. Uh, and, uh, when, and in one instance, when the crew finally came out, um, uh, uh, a couple of crew members had such severe frostbite that they suffered amputations of their feet. And that was what they were doing to serve our country. 
and uh, you know, and 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 no special thanks to them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just uh, that that to me again, the fact that those kinds of stories could have occurred and not be fully appreciated by everybody is. Uh, you know, is horrible, and, and that's part of what we're working to, to help uh, address here with this museum and the education of it. And again, I, we can't emphasize enough the detail of the, rest, the restoration that you're working with, and it's just so spectacular. Let's move on, we've got more to see. Great. Dan, this piece of hardware is from a different era than what we've been looking at before. Yes, this is a Vietnam War vehicle. It's an M274 mechanical mule. And what I like about this mechanical mule is the meaning it has for so many Vietnam War veterans. Uh, and uh, people will see this and uh, so many uh, veterans actually worked with a mechanical mule or it was really part of their life. What this is, is uh, this particular version is armed. We have a 106 millimeter recoilless rifle on it. So this, this uh, set up like this, the mechanical mule was able to carry a, a bunker busting armor uh, destroying, but in the Vietnam War era, it'd be more uh, bunker busting, mm -hmm. powerful weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, it it uh, shoots the shells we, you can see here uh, toward the back of the mechanical mule. Uh, so this was, uh, this was a, a, a fighting machine in, in its current configuration. But what it's known for even more with Vietnam uh, veterans, Vietnam War veterans, is it was a cargo carrier. So you could carry ammunition, you could carry food. You, the, uh, this mechanical mule was able to transport heavier weight than a World War II Jeep, for example. It had something like, I forget the details, but mm -hmm. something like twice the carrying capacity of, uh, of the classic World War II Jeep. So in Vietnam, uh, you didn't want to carry any more on your back than you had to, sure. and the mechanical mule was uh, just a, a real tool for so many veterans. Dan, you said earlier that you hope to expand your collection with more modern day military hardware, but is there something from World War II or maybe even World War I or Korean era that you would really like to add to your collection that you really have your sights on? Oh yeah, yeah, the, uh, the, there was a, um, a tank at the end of World War II um, called the M26 Pershing tank. It was a heavy tank uh, in contrast to the Sherman tank that was uh, classified as a medium tank. So this, the Pershing heavy tank uh, is uh, one that I'm looking for uh, to uh, add to the collection and it'll really uh, complete. Uh, then I think with that uh, Pershing M26, I don't think we'll be missing any tank from World War II in the, in the US. I think we've got one of, at least one of everything. Dan, let's circle back. Memorial Day of 2019 is when you hope to open this wonderful museum somewhere near Dubois. That'll be our grand opening. It'll be fascinating for all of us to see, Dan. I can't thank you enough for sharing this with us on Wyoming Chronicle. It's my pleasure, Craig. Thank you for, for uh, your interest in this.